Welcome to this edition of the Best of. With all due respect, it was a week of setbacks for Hillary Clinton in her fight for the Democratic presidential nomination. A week where Republican leaders continued their sometimes begrudging acceptance of Donald Trump and where a tragic event tested the two front runners and offered something of a preview for the fall. Well, the exact details are still unclear. Officials in Egypt today said an act of terrorism was more likely to have caused the crash than any technical issue. Before many details were known, however, Donald Trump jumped out ahead of the facts, getting on his social media account about 6.30 a.m. Eastern time to tweet, quote, looks like yet another terrorist attack. The airplane departed from Paris. When will we get tough, smart, and vigilant? Great hate and sickness, end quote. Politically speaking, Trump has suggested in the past that his candidacy is buoyed by the perception of and projection of strength in times of global instability, as he said in an interview on this program after the terrorist attacks in Brussels in March. I think every time we have a problem in this world, I think I do better. That's been proven in your polls. I mean, it's not that I want. I'd rather not have any problems and do worse, okay, if I had my choice. I'll say, and I really mean that. I'd rather have no problems. But I think every time we have a problem in the world, I do better. You've seen that. Whenever there's a big problem, national security type problem, I go up because people view me as much stronger. Hillary Clinton, on the other hand, waited until this afternoon to weigh in on the news of the crash today, using an interview with Chris Cuomo on CNN to also highlight Trump's impulsiveness. Well, Chris, it does appear that it was an act of terrorism, exactly how, of course, the investigation will have to determine. Well, first of all, he says a lot of things. He says a lot of things that are provocative, that actually make the important task of building this coalition, bringing everybody to the table and defeating terrorism more difficult. Why? Well, for example, when he says bar all Muslims from coming to the United States, that sends a signal to majority Muslim nations, many of whom we have to work with in order to defeat terrorism. He has advocated for more countries having nuclear weapons. That kind of unpredictable, dangerous rhetoric and the policies that he throws out there for whatever hope he has to get uh, people to respond to him uh, make us less likely that we're going to be as effective as we need to be going forward. Do you think that Donald Trump is qualified to be president? No, I do not. The kinds of positions he is stating and the consequences of those positions and even the consequences of his statements are not just offensive to people, they are potentially dangerous. Potentially dangerous. John, this is a preview of the general election fight to come, and I think today perfectly encapsulates the dynamic of Trump being Trump and Clinton trying to use all that Trumpiness against him. <laughs> if they both continue to use these approaches, who do you think has the upper hand? Well, hey, first of all, Nicole, great to be here with you um, today. Um, look, you're right. I think this does encapsulate to a large extent what the fall campaign is going to look like. Not all of it, but certainly in the national security realm. And you're talking about an election that is quite likely to pivot around a lot of national security issues. You have Hillary Clinton sounding every bit the traditional, sober, serious, tough-minded diplomat and national security uh, uh, figure that she is um, and trying to, as you say, kind of use Trump's impulsiveness and impetuousness against him and saying, look, he's too risky a bet in a time of turmoil and global strife. What you're going to have Trump saying over and over again, um, first of all, you're going to have Trump just being Trump. But second of all, you're going to have Trump making basically the argument uh, that Ronald Reagan made about Jimmy Carter. You know, instead of are you better off uh, now than you were four years ago, you're going to have Trump saying, do you feel safer now than you felt eight years ago? All of that kind of old fashioned diplomacy and sobriety and all that Hillary Clinton talk. We are no safer now. We're more imperiled now. And what we need is a different approach. Uh, maybe it seems reckless to you, but my approach is the approach that more Americans want to see, because what we want to see is just abject strength. You know, I would not have agreed with you a few months ago, but I think after watching the mood in this country after San Bernardino, watching the mood in this country, watching, you know, people that are not ideological 
players in a presidential campaign year really stop and say, what, what is going on? I mean, people do have a fear that is not always addressed by the Democrats. And Trump, I think, has rushed in and filled this vacuum. And I hate to say it, but I think that what he said in that interview with you and Mark at Mar-a-Lago has been true looking back. And I think this election will turn on whether it remains true between now and November. Right. And I, look, I don't know how it's going to turn out. I, I'm not making a prediction, really. I don't know who has the upper hand here. In any traditional year, Trump, who not only is projects strength um, and, and is impetuous and impulsive and does things like tweeting at 6 o'clock in the morning this morning, stuff that no normal nominee would ever do, which is to presume facts and evidence, to declare that it's likely terrorism before any official has spoken on the matter, that would all be considered a liability. And it may still be a liability because of the fact that Trump does does not know that much about the world. And it may be that his, that some area, there's areas that Clinton can portray as ignorance might make him seem like too risky a bet. But I just don't know at this point. It's going to be a very, I think it's going to be a very close fought thing on this topic. I agree with you. Something we'll talk about many more days after today. So Donald Trump has long warned on, a, on another front against Ms. Clinton that he would not hold back in his personal attacks against her husband, Bill Clinton. The presumptive Republican nominee has already pushed things pretty far and pretty early in the race on that front. But last night in a Fox interview with Sean Hannity, Trump took his Bubba bashing to a new level while deflecting some of the accusations made against him in a New York Times article this weekend. You know, it's not like the worst things, okay? You look at what Clinton's gone through with all of the problems and all of the things that he's done. About what Clinton's done, how big an issue should that be in the campaign? For example, I, I looked at the New York Times. Are they going to interview Juanita Broderick? Are they going to interview Paula Jones? Are they going to interview Kathleen Willey? In one case, it's about exposure. In another case, it's about groping and fondling and touching against a woman's will. And rape. And rape. John, at what point, if any, does Trump's escalating rhetoric about Bill Clinton backfire on him? Well, I think it could backfire. I don't know how soon, Nicole, but uh, you know, going as far as to playing the rape card. Now, there there was, in fact, an accusation of rape against Bill Clinton. That's not that's not false. That there was an accusation. Obviously, Trump is not so careful as to say alleged rape or accusations of rape. He just goes straight there and says, you know, basically is insinuating that Bill Clinton is a rapist. But you know, there's an answer to Sean Hannity's question, which is, no, the New York Times is not likely to go back and interview, re-interview all those women because. Bill Clinton's not running for president in 2016. Hillary Clinton is. And although Trump will try to tie Hillary Clinton to Bill Clinton's past indiscretions, I just do not think that this is an issue that is going to help him with women or going to help him with very many voters who are not already in his column. I, I, I agree with you on some counts. I think that Trump has to be cautious in this area. Um, if I were to give him any advice on this sort of specific line of attack against her, it would be to narrow the argument. The argument that I think he wants to make for Hillary Clinton is that she participated in right. the, 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 the sort of making the women part of the target. You know, she focused her ire on Monica Lewinsky, who she called a narcissistic loony tune. And she, persist, she participated in sort of objectifying the women who were, you could argue, victims of, of his, you know, power and of his um, sexual appetites, if you will. So I, I think Trump has to, I think he's made perfectly clear he's projected this line of attack. He's already engaged in this line of attack. But I think if he's going to keep it up and if he thinks it's going to do him any good, it needs to be narrowed from his campaign and from the things he says. And I, I think it's ironic that we're talking about how before any of the facts were known, he was shooting from the hip on national security. But if you're talking about sex, you've got to be more specific. But I think that's where we are in this bizarre race of 2016. In a blockbuster story in the New York Times today, Bernie Sanders' associates said the Vermont senator's campaign is willing to do exactly what Democrats fear most, inflict damage on Hillary Clinton in these final few weeks of the primary contest that he can't win, even if it bruises her for the general election. Meanwhile, Sanders is sharpening his tone on the campaign trail and making it clear that he's not willing to quit. Yesterday, dozens of his supporters started planning to protest the party's national convention in Philadelphia this summer. And last night, at a rally in Vallejo, California, Sanders was aggressive in making the argument that he'd be the better general election candidate than Clinton could ever be by going after presumptive GOP frontrunner Donald J. Trump. As Americans, we will not accept a candidate for president like Donald Trump. They will not accept a candidate who insults, 
Mexicans and Latin Americans, a candidate who insults Muslims, a candidate who insults, it seems, every day, women, who insults veterans, who insults the African-American community. Our message to the Democratic Convention is that if they want to defeat Trump, and together we must defeat Trump, together we are the campaign to do it. John, is there anything Clinton can do to put this race away and prevent a chaotic convention? Uh, yes, there is. Um, I think that what she can do is she can go and beat Bernie Sanders handily in California and New Jersey. The one thing that comes through in the New York Times story that you talked about, Nicole, is that there's still a little sense in the Sanders campaign for all of the things that he's done, all of the things that he's been saying, all of his aggressiveness, that there's still a kind of a question about how much longer he wants to go. And Tad Devine kind of alludes to it in the story after June 7th, if he loses in both of those two big states, and especially California, where He's putting a lot of effort and energy. If he lost there and lost decisively there, the wind, I think, would really come out of the Sanders, uh, out of the Sanders sails. And I think that is the best thing that she can do to help her cause, just go out there and beat him, beat him badly in that big state. But I don't understand why the sails are even up. I mean, this is a sailboat that is not going to, the, he can't be the nominee. He's been mathematically eliminated since mid-March. And what I cannot get my brain around is why there aren't more figures in the Democratic Party, why there aren't more figures, I mean, where's Elizabeth Warren? Why aren't there figures right. who the Sanders supporters respect and listen to? I would guess President Obama is somebody who energized sort of the same swath, young college kids. Why doesn't anyone stand up and say, it is over, Uncle Bernie. It is time to go home. You can go back to the Senate and make mischief. But this thing is over. And every time that you cement into undecided voters' minds that Hillary might be corrupt, that she might be part of a rigged political system, that she and the DNC are in cahoots, you weaken her. And she's now standing in a heated contest against Donald Trump. So if she loses by this much, I think we can look back at this period in the Democratic primary as when the most damage was in inflicted on her. Well, I'll just say I like the idea of you calling him Uncle Bernie. I think that'll go down very well in the Sanders campaign. And up next, a Republican congressman gives us his update on the great GOP unity project of 2016. That and more right after this. With us now from the Cannon Rotunda on Capitol Hill, David Jolly, a Republican congressman from Florida, who, as far as we can tell, does not yet have both feet on the Trump train. He also is trying to become a senator from Florida, so he's got a lot going on. Congressman, thank you for joining us. You got it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Um, so fill us in. Where do you stand on your own internal and public deliberations about whether you are going to be enthusiastically for Donald Trump rather than just for yeah. Trump because he's not Hillary Clinton? You know, I'm, I'm not there yet. Uh, I do hope Donald has the ability to unify the party, truly unify the party by November. Look, my issues are kind of conservative issues in addition to tone. It's uh, suggestions that we can print money to pay off the debt or renegotiate the debt, suggestions of pulling out of NATO, one of the great security forces in the history of the country. There are strong policy differences. I did call on him to drop out of the race in November, and I had supported another candidate. But Donald won it fair and square. He's earned the opportunity to try to unify the party. I think you saw some movement on his behalf last week. I do hope by the time we get to November, we can have a unified party, because we know Hillary Clinton's policies, at least on our side of the aisle, we believe are wrong for the future of the country, wrong for foreign policy. Congressman Jolly, it's Willie Geist. Good to see you this evening. Um, what could Donald hey, Trump with you, possibly say in the next couple of weeks or months to you on a phone call or a meeting that would convince you that he's a true conservative? Look, I, I have serious policy concerns. And so, yes, I would like to see those addressed. I mentioned NATO. I mentioned printing money to pay off the national debt. I have concerns about targeting women and children, bringing back torture, uh, a religious test that I don't think is necessary to secure the borders. We should have a security test, but not a religious test. So obviously, I'd like to see some movement in that direction, but also in a very credible way. Uh, one of the reasons that I have withheld my support as of today uh, is to really see who is Donald Trump in November. 
You know, to ask me in May whether or not I will support a candidate in November, not knowing exactly what the platform will be, I'm just not prepared to do it. Am I going to stand in the way? No. He's won the nomination of our party. Uh, the party should begin to look at him for leadership. I hope it's leadership that I'm able to support come November, but I'm not there yet. And I don't know if I will get there by November. We'll see. So, Congressman, you've made one of your signature issues, something we've talked to you about before, the STOP Act, to try to create the, That's right. try to break the nexus right. between incumbency and raising money. Uh, incumbents would right. still be able to raise money under your plan, but you wouldn't be able to, as an incumbent, ask people for campaign contributions. That's right. Looking at Donald Trump now, the, the, the presumptive nominee of your party, and how he's approached fundraising, is he a kindred spirit, do you think, on these issues? So Willie said, what could Donald Trump do to get my support? Uh, I'd love to have Donald Trump <laughs> endorse the STOP Act. It is right in line with this kind of populist movement that he is leading. The reason he's brought so many new voters is because he's saying, let's get Washington back to work. My STOP Act says members of Congress should be prohibited from directly soliciting a campaign contribution for themselves or for their party. A lot of state legislatures do it across the country. Judges on the ballot in 30 states are prohibited from directly raising money. The U.S. Supreme Court has upheld that prohibition. It's less campaign finance reform and more congressional reform. It says instead of spending 20 to 30 hours a week raising money, let's have a Congress that puts down the phone and gets back to work on issues like border security and immigration reform, balanced budget, foreign policy, transportation, tax reform. Let's get a Congress back to work. It's called the STOP Act. We've got a website, thestopact.com. I need the support of every American, but I need the support of Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders to get this over the finish line. And yet, Congressman, you've only found eight co-sponsors for this. It <laughs> right. seems to me like the kind of thing, if they really were serious about campaign so. finance reform, they'd jump on board this. I think the American public listens to you talk about it. It makes sense. Sure. Why haven't you found more support there in the hall behind you? So I joke, it's seven more co-sponsors than I thought we would have. <laughs> uh, but it is, it's a reflection, a heartbreaking reflection on how little actually gets done up here. It's also a heartbreaking reflection on how money controls re-elections. Listen, I'm not judging or criticizing my colleagues. I'm trying to give them breathing room to work on the priorities they came here to work on. When I mention the Stop Act to them, they see the relief. They see the breathing room. They want to be helpful. And then you see the reality of big money sink in, and they realize they've got to spend their time raising money. And their political survival relies on raising money. And so incumbents don't want to talk about it. We are starting a movement. When we came out with the STOP Act, I started hearing from people coast to coast, Republicans, Democrats, independents. A third grader understands, get back to work. Work on the issues that your constituencies have asked you to work on. And so just as the retiree in Iowa sent a letter and said, here's five dollars, please help get the STOP Act done. We need folks from across the country, but we need political leaders, our own leadership in Congress, but the presidential candidates as well, Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton, to say the STOP Act is one small step we could implement right now, and we can then tackle the very complex issue of broad-based campaign finance reform. Congressman Dave Jolly, man on a mission, a couple missions at least. Congressman, it. thank you very much. Coming up, Bernie Sanders campaign manager Jeff Weaver after this quick word from our sponsors. Burlington, Vermont, Bernie Sanders campaign manager, Jeff Weaver, who joins us again. Jeff, thank you for coming on. My pleasure. Um, we were pretty surprised by, by Senator Sanders' statement on Nevada uh, and his uh, calling out uh, what he thought was bad practices. Just tell people, what, what's the worst thing that happened on Saturday that really voters should know about around the country and care about? Well, I mean, the way the convention started, I think if you watch the video online, you can see it. And, and this was uh, confirmed by uh, people like Senator Nina Turner, who was there in the room, uh, who's a former senator from Ohio. Uh, when they tried to pass temporary rules to shut off debate in, in the event, uh, they were asked for the yeas and nays, you know, a voice vote. Uh, people in the room pretty clearly said that the nays won it. Uh, at worst, it was indecisive, and yet uh, the chair overruled them, uh, said the eyes had it, and then proceeded, you know, to run the convention under these uh, modified temporary rules, uh, which were designed to sort of foreclose debate. So what's the difference between the outcome that, that exists now and the outcome that you think would have existed had the thing been run, from your point of view, fairly? 
Well, I'm not sure uh, what the, how the outcome would have been different, Mark, but I don't think that's really the issue. The issue is, is is, is a huge segment of the Democratic Party going to be treated with fairness? Uh, and I don't think that that happened in Nevada, uh, based on everybody that I have uh, talked to. You know, the Bernie Sanders has run in states all across this country, uh, and by and large, state Democratic parties have been extremely fair and tried to be even-handed. Uh, and that just was not the experience in Nevada, either at the state level or, you know, if you look back at the Clark County Convention that happened recently, uh, where they tried to depose a against their own rules, their own credentials chair, and almost had her arrested uh, because there was a perception that she was being too fair to the Sanders people. So there's been a long, this is not just Saturday, it's a long, it was a lot of events leading up to it. I think there was a lot of frustration. Uh, obviously our campaign uh, condemns any uh, suggestion of violence uh, or threats, uh, but clearly there has been a, a level of unfairness uh, in Nevada that we have not seen in other states. Jeff, uh, this is Al Hunt here. Let me ask you, tell us about the Harry Reid, uh, Bernie Sanders uh, uh, conversation. Well, I don't really talk about people's conversations. I know they've had a couple of conversations. I think they're uh, positive conversations. You know, they're friends. They've served with each other in the Senate for many, many years. I think there's a lot of mutual respect. Uh, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm not really going to get into... Uh, uh, no, but, but Senator Reid clearly the, didn't... End Senator Reid clearly didn't anticipate what Senator Sanders uh, uh, said this afternoon. There, I mean, it was obvious in what uh, Senator Reid said beforehand. Right. Well, you know, what Senator Sanders said is, is he obviously condemns violence. He wants uh, uh, the people who support him to be treated fairly. There's nine million people, over nine million people in this country who have supported him. Uh, there certainly is resistance among uh, some establishment players in the Democratic Party, whether they be in the, the Nevada State Party or uh, certainly at the national, at the DNC, uh, who you know, are not as welcoming of all of these new people who have come into the process. All these young people, democratically aligned independents in many cases, uh, who have come out and supported the Senator Sanders' message to deal with a uh, corrupt campaign finance system and, and a rigged economy. So, you know, there's some... Do you include, uh, do you include uh, Brooklyn or the... Do you include Brooklyn and the Clinton campaign in that criticism? No, I mean, I have... I, the, the Clinton campaign has not weighed in on this... Uh, uh, per se, but uh, you know, obviously, uh, I think uh, people perceive themselves as operating in the in the interests of the Clinton campaign. Jeff, given the success you've already had and are likely to have in the remaining contest, is it fair to say now that you're going to go to the convention with the posture of trying to do everything you can to win over superdelegates in Philadelphia? And so Philadelphia will be more about, or at least partially about, fighting still for the nomination rather than coming together behind Secretary Clinton and fighting Donald Trump. Is that fair to say? Well, I think what it's fair to say is whoever comes out of the convention as the nominee, I think will come out uh, with a united party uh, that is prepared to take on uh, Trump and the Republicans. I think that is certainly fair to say. You know, this process has a long way to go. We will see how the final states go. You know, if the uh, delegate margin can be narrowed substantially, I think that there certainly will be an appeal to superdelegates. I think the senator has said that uh, uh, himself. But there are other issues as well at the convention that have to be dealt with, including the platform and including looking for ways to open up uh, the nominating process and to deal with you know, many of the things that we've seen over the course of the year in the various states uh, that are often, you know, not a, a result of malice, but just sort of institutional impediments to people and, uh, being able to yep. fully and, participate and in Jeff, the democratic process. I'm not, I'm not process. trying to instigate a fight here, but it just seems to me it, right. you all have had enough success, no matter what happens tonight, even almost no matter what happens uh, in June, that you, your posture seems to be, and I'm just trying to confirm that, that the convention is sure. about f having d disputes about who the nominee is, going to be, who the superdelegates should vote for, what should be in the platform, should the rules of how Democrats nominate their candidates in the future, that that's, a, for you all, that's what Philadelphia is about, more than uniting in the beginning of the convention behind Hillary Clinton. Is that fair to say? Well, I think at this point that that's, that that's exactly right. I mean, the, the convention is about nominating uh, the candidate of the Democratic Party for President of the United States. That's the whole point of the convention. Right. So you go into that. You're not looking forward to showing up in Philadelphia if Hillary Clinton seems anointed by the media. You're not looking forward to showing up in Philadelphia from day one and saying, let's let's figure out when Senator Sanders is going to give his big speech endorsing her. Is that well, I, I mean, let's be clear, the media anointed Secretary Clinton uh, the day that Sec Senator Sanders announced his candidacy. I mean, this has always been an uphill fight. Uh, and he is, has said repeatedly he is going all the way to the convention. Uh, uh, so you don't need to hear from me. He said it repeatedly. I mean, Jeff, Jeff, give us one or two of the most important platform planks for the Sanders uh, uh, campaign. 
Well, I think there, I think there are many of the issues that he's been talking about. You know, a, a universal health care through a single payer system, fifteen dollar minimum wage, uh, uh, free tuition at public colleges uh, and universities, uh, dealing with a broken trade policy. I mean, I could go on, but you know, those are the sort of, uh, you know, dealing with climate change. Okay, Jeff. That's Weaver? a big list. Jeff, last question. Got to be a quick one. Sure. Sure. Of course. What, what, Always. What, what adjective would you use to describe the mood in your headquarters right now? Uh, I think uh, it, it determined. I think would be the the uh, okay. would be the adjective I would use. Very determined leader, Jeff Weaver. Jeff, thank you. And when we come back, we're joined by Director Jay Roach to talk about his latest project and what it means for your daily commute, traffic, and weather. Together, right after this. gets elected, you can forget about poverty. You can forget about civil rights. Is that what you want? Now, I'm trying to turn this country around and prevent a major war. Christ, why the hell did I ever consider you for my vice president? First sign of trouble, you cut and run. That was a scene from the film, brand new, All the Way, which is based on the Tony Award-winning play about President Lyndon Johnson. It debuts on HBO this Sunday at 8 p.m. Joining us now is the director of the movie, Jay Roche. We're going to watch another clip that we're going to talk about the incredible film you've made. Great. This clip depicts Johnson discussing the civil rights bill with his vice president, Hubert Humphrey. You told Dr. King you wanted this bill passed without one word change. You don't go and sell a horse by talking about it being blind in one eye and got well, the heat. They're going to think you're just gutting the bill, sir. Bull This ain't about principles. It's about votes. You know, that's a problem with you goddamn liberals. You don't know how to fight. Huh. So Jay Roach has made another great film uh, about America. Uh, this one with, I say, if not our greatest actor today, one of our greatest actors. Tell us about mm -hmm. why you were interested in LBJ, because you like interesting characters. Why were you so interested in them? Well, he's a complex guy, uh, an unbelievable politician, someone who actually believes you can do things with government and got a huge amount done, we, we sort of forget looking back through Vietnam, looking backwards to, to what he accomplished in 64 and 65 and 66. One of the most important things he accomplished was the Civil Rights Bill of 1964. And to take that on at that time when he was seen as the accidental president after JFK's assassination just seemed like an incredible story. And Brian Cranston inhabits LBJ. On, on, to an unbelievable degree. He channels him. He got his physicality and he, we got his look. Uh, it's it's pretty amazing to watch. I, I, could, I can say that. Al. Uh, Jay, it's Al, Al Hunt. I Hi. saw the movie uh, last night at the National Archives. It was absolutely brilliant. And uh, you. you were so right about Cranston. There would be times where you would see uh, you know, Cranston and then you would go back to a, an LBJ scene in 64 and you weren't <laughs> sure which was LBJ and which was Cranston. And I also thought the Lady Bird and the Richard Russell and the uh, J. Edgar Hoover were uh, absolutely phenomenal. How much were you guided, both the play uh, and, and the movie, by, by Robert Caro's uh, 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 great works on Lyndon Johnson? Well, Robert Schenken, uh, our playwright, became our screenwriter. He did the adaptation himself of his own Tony-winning play. So he had done most of the research before the play. I got to inherit that, but then we did a lot of our own research. We went out and, and spoke to a number of people who were there directly, uh, a number of the civil rights leaders, uh, uh, Congressman John Lewis, Congressman Jim Clyburn, um, uh, Ambassador Andrew Young was a, a a consultant on our film, as well as a number of the people in the Johnson uh, administration at the time. You, you mentioned Vietnam earlier. Lyndon Johnson does very poorly when uh, he asked about uh, uh, the public's view of presidents. Uh, I don't think there's an airport in the country named after him, because hmm. it's all Vietnam. Do you think that this will begin to educate people on the fact that there was another side of Lyndon Johnson that probably did more great works than any president since Roosevelt? I, you know, that's how I usually describe it. I, I had forgotten. I, I came, I was like 10 or 11 years old in 68 when he decided not to run again due to uh, the unpopularity of the war. 
and I had forgotten. And you look at the, the work he did in 64, 65, 66, so Medicare, Medicaid, uh, quadrupling the ex federal foreign financing, uh, foreign, uh, national financing of, uh, of education and uh, NPR, PBS. He, he passed more legislation in those few those few uh, years than almost any president had since, as you said, since FDR. And I, I think what people will notice when you, when you watch the film is just what it's like for someone who actually believes government can improve the quality of lives of Americans and, and has spent his whole life learning how to do that and, and did it incredibly well during those early years. This film has an incredible cast, and you've worked with lots of great people, but I'm just obsessed with Brian Cranston these days. Between Breaking Bad and the two films you've now done with him, uh, what is, what, I know this is like the most basic question to ever ask a director about an actor, but what makes him so good at this? <laughs> Well, I think one of the great things that happened to him is he didn't become famous uh, right away early in his career. He was a great character actor for so many years. I like to work with actors who uh, are great at drama but who are also great at comedy. Uh, he has that range. Johnson was a prankster sometimes to, to get you to jump on his side to pass a bill. He might tell you a ridiculously off-color joke or, or drive you around in, in his amphibious car like right. he did to throw you off balance and then pressure you and even bully you to uh, to get things done and Brian's range uh, you know he did this in Trumbo too but from the most intimate uh, suspenseful little soul at stake moment all the way to the big larger than life Texan that that Johnson could be an actor like Brian, you know, you, you need a guy like that going into a story like this. And to take it from a play that was extraordinarily well received, uh, both yep. before it got to Broadway and on Broadway, to a film, are there models for that? Because that doesn't always work out. It doesn't always work out. In this case, you, you open it up like uh, Robert Schengen did in the screenplay, but what I love uh, about Johnson's character in particular is that he would get in your face right next to you a few inches and and put so much pressure, he called it the Johnson treatment, or at least other people did, or the Texas twist. And I thought to make it more cinematic, it might be go smaller, like get, get in there with the lens and watch this, this great performance as, as you forget he's Brian Cranston. And same with the other cast too, Melissa Leo as Lady Bird, Frank Langella, uh, the great Frank Langella as uh, Senator Dick Russell, um, Bradley Whitford as a pretty incredible Humphrey, yeah. you know, so it, it was, it was to, to get great performances and be right in there with and a privileged position that the camera can get you into. Jay, as, as well as the political brilliance of Johnson, you captured the dark side, the, the, the really extraordinary insecurities. At one point he said he was going to quit before the uh, yeah. 64 election. Was that hard for, for Cranston to capture? Because he certainly did it, did it uh, vividly. You know, the, those few days during the Democratic convention when he's actually curled up in bed, uh, yeah. like you say, sure the South is going to abandon him, sure that he's going to lose the election, depending on Lady Bird to just give him enough courage to get out of bed. So self-pitying. Uh, I heard all that in the phone calls. There are, there are these incredible, you know, many, many recorded phone calls available to us now. And you could feel that on stage, but on the film, you could really get a sense of how vulnerable he was, how, how great the personality, uh, psychological uh, swings were for him. And again, uh, Brian just, uh, he's got it all, man. He's got that range. So uh, I, I wasn't too nervous about pulling that one off. Jay Rocher, I should say, worked with on Game Change. <laughs> and to paraphrase Donald Trump, we're getting sick of your success. <laughs> Still ahead, a very frank conversation with Frank Bernie of the New York Times. We'll be right back. Joining us now to discuss some of the big news of the day, New York Times columnist Frank Bruni. Thank you for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Um, for me, the fill-in with both the stars gone. <laughs> That's very, very benevolent. You're doing of you. a great job. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Someone made you say that. I heard it. Um, <laughs> so I want to just start with today's news. I yeah. think we got, you know, the essence of Donald Trump tweeting before the, any of the morning shows started. This was terrorism, and you know, we've got to be stronger. And then we got the essence of Hillary Clinton waiting 
um, like most normal politicians, for more of the facts to be known and then responding a little later in the day. What do you think? I think you. I think you said it all right there. I mean, but, that's, but who's who? That's the who, two of them in a nutshell. Who will be judged to have done better today? I mean, well, I mean, that's what we're going to find out in this election, right? I mean, do Americans want to feel viscerally about this stuff, and do they want the country to act viscerally, which I would submit is pretty dangerous, um, or are they still in a place? Um, where they can be a little bit more cool-headed. I mean, that's the story of this election. Are we going to be yeah. going with a sort of animal instinct, or are we going to be going with our brains? Now, you covered, and I worked for, a politician who was sometimes criticized, George W. Bush, for responding in, in, in um, the face of terrorism at a gut level. We'll get him dead or alive. Right. Um, but I think he found, when he got out on the road, that that was the kind of strength that people hungered for. Do you think any of that has changed? I think people hunger for a degree of certainty, and they definitely hunger for some passion. And I think Hillary Clinton is struggling, has always struggled, continues to struggle with, with kind of capturing and projecting a kind of passion that people can connect to. And that is, I wouldn't say it's Trump's edge in this election, because I think he is the underdog, but that, that, is, that is the wild card that could really end up propelling him past her in the end. That's not my prediction, but I'm saying right. we don't know anything. Um, I think there's a real difference between George Bush and, and Donald Trump. Oh, definitely, I, I mean, definitely. I, I didn't mean to suggest and, no, 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 that. And you work for him, but I'm, I'm trying to imagine George W. Bush up at night tweeting Never. as soon as something arrives. And it, he was he was a much much more reserved guy. Never, than that. He, yeah. to, in my judgment, he he was sort of the perfect combination of understanding what people were feeling, but certainly waiting for all of the facts to be known and very cognizant of the impact on on the allies and the. And yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't use the word perfect, um, uh, but definitely I think there was more of a sense of the responsibility of the office, and I think there was a much greater awareness of um, what impulse could do in terms of damage. And I think that's the great question about, about Trump when it comes to the presidency and foreign policy. I mean, have we ever had a president who seemed as impulsive as he's been? And if candidate Trump is a preview of what President Trump would be like, what would that mean for national security? I think voters need to ask themselves that question. I think John has a question for you next. Hey, Frank, in the, in the words of the great salt and pepper, let's talk about sex. Um, I, I, I've been, I, I was, uh, I, I was taken I with, uh, I was taken, I was taken with your column um, back on May 7th. You had a column that was called, the title of which was Sex and the Single Paul. And it was about Donald Trump as out front proud Lothario, okay? So I'd like you to first just summarize the thesis of that column, and then I'm going to ask you a couple questions about it. Sure, yeah. I mean, the thesis of that column was we have had many candidates for president who have run from a uh, sexually randy past. We've never had one where that past was so well known and not not in contest. There was no attempt to deny it um, and had just moved on from that point. And that, that's a real turning point in American politics. I mean, w so many candidates have spent so much energy denying the kinds of things that Trump has said out loud on the Howard Stern show through the ages. Um, and so it's interesting to see him thus far not being penalized to the extent one might expect by the electorate. Yeah, I right. mean, I so would just... Of, oh, so sorry. So, so just a lot of Democrats, Frank, I think have thought that it's kind of crazy for Trump to be throwing rocks at Bill Clinton's house when Trump himself lives in a rather glass house on this matter. <laughs> um, but, it, but after the New York Times story, your paper this, week, this weekend had its big blockbuster on Trump and women, it seems like he's no less emboldened and no less brazen in terms of talking about Bill Clinton's indiscretions than he was before. How do you see this whole dynamic playing out? You know, I, I don't know. I mean, it's going to be very interesting to see how voters respond to it. I mean, Trump would say that the difference is, yes, he has um, uh, had his playtime with many women, um, and yes, maybe the nature of his relationships with some women is not does not fit the ideal that a lot of people would have. He accuses Bill Clinton of actually being an abuser, of someone who's guilty of sexual assault, and he's adding another element which is really important here in terms of how it ends up getting perceived. He's painting Hillary as Bill Clinton's enabler, and he's challenging her credentials as a feminist. Um, and that is obviously a very deliberate thing because he needs to make up ground with women voters. To look at polls now, he'd practically have to get every white male in America to vote for him in order to make up for the gender and racial gaps. I want to I stay on sex because it's so much more fun than anything else we get to talk about. Um, but I feel like I'm on the I Robin wanna, Bird so, show. so I feel, though, <laughs> like the one person that got under Trump's skin was Marco Rubio when he talked about the size of Trump's 
<clears throat> pants. And Trump spent two days responding to the size and splendor of his hands. And I wonder if you think there's some psyops level where someone could sort of get to him by questioning these sorts of things that he's tried to turn into an asset. Well, I, I think that's a great question because I think what you saw in those two days when he was crowing about his beautiful long fingers um, <laughs> was was this serious. Is so fun. No, but I mean it's kind of crazy because he right? was showing you what's important to him. Exactly. What really matters in exactly. his image. And and that this this goes back to the column I wrote, Sex and the Singular Paul. Right. Have we ever had a politician who got this far, a nominee of one of the two parties who was this candid? Of my party, for Christ's yeah, sake. <laughs> who, was, who was this candid, and I think the perfect adjective is naked, right. about his reputation, his believed reputation, his desired reputation as a swordsman, shall we say. Right. Oh God! Swords, you. fingers, hands. This is like I the can't take it. This is the, this is the euphemism. <laughs> just. God, the, foul, the, the, foul, the phallic imagery down there is just getting out of hand, so to speak. Um, but Frank, let me ask you as a last question, right? So here's Hillary Clinton standing in the middle of this. She got Donald Trump on one side. She's got Bill Clinton on the other side. Both of whom, you know, have very colorful pasts. What's the way in which she can profit from this environment in which these two kind of alpha males are uh, engaged in uh, various kinds of, 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 of jousting, so to speak, over, um, over these matters that we've just been discussing? I think she's got to do what she's largely been doing, and unfortunately, it's a little bit boring, but she's never going to get past boring. I think she's got to focus on the work she's done, the jobs she's held. She has got, I mean, people disagree on how well she's done in those jobs. She's got as dazzling a resume as any presidential candidate that we've had in the last quarter century, maybe even half century. And I think the more she can keep directing people toward that, that's her big advantage over Donald Trump. And at the end of the day, if voters want her, they're going to want her for that reason. Uh, thank you very much. A, a very varied conversation. <laughs> Don't forget, if you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can also listen to us on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. We will be right back. Thank you for watching this edition of The Best of With All Due Respect. Be sure to check out BloombergPolitics.com for updates on the election all weekend long. We'll have a brand new With All Due Respect right here on Monday. Until then, thanks for watching. Sayonara.